Hey there, it is Saturday, so it's movie night, and I am here to present another quadruple feature for your viewing pleasure. My name is Paul. This is our video for week 34, and this Saturday is a very important day, November 7th, just a little bit ago before filming this. They officially announced that Joe Biden is going to become the 46th president of the United States. Kamala Harris is going to become the first woman vice president, the first black Asian vice president. So this is a monumental day. Democracy has paid off. We have been counting all of the votes despite Trump's efforts to stop all of the counting so that he can try to win this election. And you go online and there's all kinds of uh, Republicans claiming that the Democrats are stealing this election just because they're counting the votes. It's it's absurd. They're coming up with all these crazy numbers for like, if there's this many people registered to vote, how did they vote this many times? And it's like, your numbers to start with aren't even right, but it's ridiculous. And I think everyone knows it and no one's really taking it seriously, but it does concern me that there is such a huge faction of people out there that are so easily manipulated and convinced by Trump who think he's the, the, the second coming. But um, regardless, we shouldn't let that damper our day uh, because this is a, this is, this is, this is huge. And obviously this doesn't fix everything that's wrong in the country, but this is certainly the first step. And if you go on social media, of course, there's people already trying to kind of shit on this and being like, oh, so funny that liberals think Joe Biden's going to fix everything and he's going to be the answer to all of our problems. He's not going to be the answer to all of our problems, but he believes in science. You know, he believes that there's systemic racism. There's like issues that he's going to be able to start to fix as opposed to someone who's uh, actively fanning the flames and making things worse. Now we have about two more months left of Trump, so hopefully he does not fucking get us nuked in the meantime. Uh, of course, he's going to be knocking over as much shit as he can on his way out of the White House before he's inevitably dragged out of there kicking and screaming by Secret Service. He's going to make it as difficult as possible for Joe Biden to uh, have an effective run at president, uh, especially right when he gets in. He's just going to have to do so much damage control. But it is, a, it is a victory that we have, so I do think we should be celebrating it. And yeah, this is not the, the end to all of, all of the issues that are going on. This is the beginning, and yes, there's a lot of hard work to do. And there's a lot of things that we still need to address. This week today, we're going to be talking about one of the big things that we need to start to do our best to reverse right now for the world. That's climate change. You know, Trump was a climate change denier. He told scientists to their faces that they're wrong. Science doesn't know what it's talking about. But I mean, if you take a look around at the way climate is acting all around the world, global warming is very definitely a thing. And if it's not something that we actively work to fix, like we're fucked, like we're not leaving behind a inhabitable planet for future generations. So this is going to be one of the main things that needs to be focused on directly. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because our topic is disaster porn. Look, I live in California and we are long overdue for a huge earthquake. And I know we just got a piece of amazing news with Joe Biden winning the election. However, if 2020 tracks, I mean, of course, the big one is going to be happening at some point this year. We've got two months left in 2020. I just think if you live in California, just brace yourselves. You know, the way 2020 has tracked so far, it makes sense. So maybe prepare yourself. Just uh, keep some extra cash on hand. Have some extra bottles of water laying around the house. Keep a pair of sneakers by your bed and maybe watch some disaster porn movies to uh, mentally put yourself in the place where you might need to be uh, if we have to start uh, going to extreme measures for survival in a disaster situation. I love disaster porn movies. They're a guilty pleasure of mine. Uh, as much as I don't want to see the world crumble in real life, I love watching it happen cinematically. So we're going to be looking at four of my favorite disaster porn movies. Now disaster porn, it has a bad name, right? Because people kind of look at it as trashy movies. They're not very good. Hopefully I'm going to prove that's, that's absolutely not the case because I picked some movies that I genuinely think are really, really solid movies. And I'm going to talk about a couple others as well. Yeah, they're kind of like trashy popcorn fun in most instances, but sometimes they're actually a legitimately good movie with good characters and, and good stories. So I'm gonna talk about a few of those. We're gonna talk about a few of the trashy ones. 
as well. Um, I've tried to make the options quite varied, and I've tried to pick maybe a couple things that you haven't seen. Um, but yeah, if you like disaster porn movies, I can't imagine very many people are actually watching this video this week. There's probably a lot of celebrating that's going on. You're probably spending your evening with you know, booze and cake rather than watching movies, but I'm gonna be watching some movies. Hopefully uh, you'll join along. So let's take a look at some disaster porn films. The word disaster porn, they're called disaster porn because it's basically like the audience getting off from watching destruction. The first disaster porn movie I can ever really recall seeing when I was a kid was The Poseidon Adventure. This came out in 1972. And this, in addition to airport, really kicked off a lot of disaster movies through the 70s. They were very popular in the 70s, and this was the first time I can ever recall seeing one. So the ship like flips upside down, and all the people that were uh, on this luxury liner uh, at the top now have to make their way to the bottom of the ship by climbing up the ship so that they can so they can get out before the ship sinks. And it was just, I thought, a, a, a great adventure. I immediately was attracted to these types of movies for a few reasons. They typically feature an ensemble and you don't know who's gonna make it and who's not gonna make it. That's just kind of adds a level of excitement. It's a lot of faces, it's a lot of stories. So disaster porn films usually kind of keep the movie uh, moving along at a rapid clip because there's so much to focus on. And the other thing is in almost all disaster porn films, I, I, I do find that they're quite inspiring because it's a terrible situation that has happened, and then a group of people need to come together and despite their differences, find a way to make it better. So it's trying to overcome insurmountable odds by coming together, and without a doubt, there are really emotional sequences in almost every disaster porn film where someone has to sacrifice themselves so that other people can make it. It's kind of a trope of the genre, but it's one that gets me. And the, and, and the first time I saw it was in Poseidon Adventure. There's a few scenes like that, but you know, sequences where they have to hold their breath and like swim under for a long time. As a kid, I was like riveted and, and really terrified. So the Poseidon Adventure and Airport are two movies that really kicked off the disaster porn trend in the 70s. There were a lot of disaster porn films. The Towering Inferno, Earthquake, three subsequent sequels for uh, Airport, and then of course Airplane, the you know famous comedy by the Zucker Brothers starring Leslie Nielsen. Airplane is a parody of all of those disaster porn films that were out in the 70s. So it's kind of funny because Airplane has become more iconic and memorable than any of those disaster porn movies, which is funny. I mean, that would be the equivalent of like scary movie becoming more widely remembered than Scream and all of the slasher movies it was trying to parody. I mean, there's no way that's gonna happen, but that's essentially what happened with Airplane as, as some of these films sort of kind of fell into obscurity, but this is one that really stands out. We're not watching The Poseidon Adventure, uh, but I just kind of wanted to lay the ground roots of some of these disaster porn movies and the, and the trends that uh, happened with them. So through the 70s, they were very popular. They died down a bit through the 80s, and then disaster porn came back really big in the 90s. And I would say one of the movies that helped kick off disaster porn again was Independence Day, which came out in 1994. Now, Roland Emmerich is the filmmaker who made that, and he predominantly makes disaster porn films. The Day After Tomorrow, 2012, like that's his bread and butter, is essentially destroying the White House in a bunch of different ways. But even though Independence Day is probably more categorized easily as like a sci-fi film, it definitely has like staples of disaster porn, of basically just like monuments getting blown up and destroyed in some way or another. So Independence Day, I think, really kicked off a new resurgence of disaster porn. A lot of the movies that were coming out in the 90s, Volcano, Deep Impact, uh, Dante's Peak, I mean, there were there were a whole lot of them. If you like disaster porn, the 90s were really where it was at. But our four movies that we're actually gonna be talking about, they're all from different decades to try to keep the style of the disaster porn particularly varied. I'm not gonna pick four movies from the 90s. I'm only picking one from the 90s. Well, a couple others that I really love that we're not watching today, but I'll just go ahead and bring up Knowing, starring Nicolas Cage. This movie is legitimately really good. I mean, it has kind of a bizarre sci-fi angle to it, but if you kind of just accept that you're gonna go on a crazy trip, I think Knowing is a really solid film that got unfairly bashed by critics. 
because it's actually quite thrilling. It's, it's a premise that I find so fascinating. It's a very uh, M. Night Shyamalan type premise that I think winds up delivering on the movie really well. So it's basically about a, a, a little girl who is in class 50 years ago, and they the class is doing a project where they're doing a time capsule that they're going to unbury in 50 years. Like, the students of the, of the school are going to find this time capsule 50 years from now. And this girl is just, like, writing numbers. She's, like, hearing whispering, and she's just, like, writing all these numbers. And then the teacher, like, gets her paper, and she's like, the fuck, man? You were supposed to draw a picture for the kids of the future or whatever. So she sticks the paper with all the numbers in the in the time capsule 50 years later Nicholas Cage's son is at the school and they're giving all of the kids in the class as they pull up the time capsule one of the letters and so the kid opens it up and all he has is the paper with all of the numbers and he's like what the hell is this Nicholas Cage sees it when he gets home that night and he's looking at it and he sees the numbers nine one one two zero zero one he just kind of catches that glimpse of, of numbers in this huge spreadsheet of numbers. And he's like, what the hell? And there's a number after it as well, like 2000 something, whatever. And then he's like, Whoa, what the heck? And so he sees that it's 9-11-2001. So he, he puts that into, into the internet search. And the number that pops up after that is the amount of people that died on that day. So he's like, what the hell? So then he starts going through all of these numbers and breaking them down, putting dashes in and realizing that there are dates and then he'll look up the date and then he'll find a disaster that happened on that date. And the next number is the amount of people that died in that disaster. So he starts becoming obsessed with this piece of paper, mapping out all of these natural disasters that have happened over the years or not natural disasters or terrorist attacks or something like that. And then he gets to like, the dates get to past where he's at. So now there's like dates in the future. So this girl has like written down all predictions for all of these disasters that are gonna happen. And now he basically has, it's that age old story of like, if you go back in time and then you get like a, a, like a book of all of the famous sports, like in Back to the Future, all of the, the sports events that have happened, now you can bet on all of those. You know all of the outcomes for all of these sporting events, right? Except like a, like a, like a negative twist on that because now he knows disasters that are going to happen and he has to try to convince people something horrible is going to happen in New York tomorrow and 300 people are going to die. And the people are like, okay, you sound like, you sound Looney Tunes. And it's basically him trying to stop these disasters. It's a premise that I think is very fascinating. I think that's like a really, a really delicious idea for, for a movie. And then it goes in, you know, it goes into some pretty crazy areas, but I actually think it's a legitimately a really good movie that got a very bad shake by critics. And I don't think enough people have seen knowing, but it also has really, really fantastic scenes of destruction which is what we're talking about today. This movie, this, this quadruple feature is all about mass destruction and there's a train crash, there's an airplane crash, there's, uh, there's some other stuff that's really spectacular and the effects are really good. So if you just want like solid, sit down, shut your brain off disaster porn, knowing is really cool and it has a, a, a more interesting premise than most disaster porn films have. Another one that I'm just going to quickly talk about before we dive into our four, I didn't pick a Roland Emmerich film to watch tonight because I feel like Michael Bay and Roland Emmerich are so similar with their style of destruction. I didn't want to pick one from each of them, but I picked the one that I think is more entertaining and, and influential for, for the Disaster Porn Quadruple feature we're watching tonight. But I do want to talk about 2012. And I actually, I own it and I can't fucking find it. I, this is my first quadruple feature in the new condo and I have not organized the movies yet. So they're all over the place. So thankfully I found the movies that I wanted for tonight, but I couldn't find 2012 to hold up a copy for you. But 2012 is such a stupid movie. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's way too long. It's crazy. It's over the top. However, there are some brilliant scenes of destruction in that movie, particularly an earthquake explosion, like hellscape that destroys California. And something about watching the place where you live being destroyed, I don't know, it kind of gives you sort of a sick satisfaction. And the scene of California getting destroyed is breathtaking, it is thrilling, it is really a phenomenal sequence in in, a, in an average movie that is filled with really amazing effects and scenes of destruction. But the California destruction scene in like the first act or so of the movie 
is the highlight of the film. It's I remember seeing it in theaters and and it was like it was mind blowingly exciting. I, I really love that one. But now let's talk about the four movies we're going to be watching for our quadruple feature on disaster porn. Okay, first we are going back to what's got to be the first one of the first disaster porn films. Of course, this is long before the term disaster porn was in our lexicon. This was not something we called movies. This was just a movie about a disaster that happened. It is from 1958, A Night to Remember. A Night to Remember is about the sinking of the Titanic. And James Cameron's Titanic, I think, is a really good movie. I think it's really fun. It's also very long. What is it, like three and a half hours? And it has like this, this whole love story drawn out throughout it. And the love story is, of course, what people love about Titanic. A Night to Remember is basically Titanic just the facts, ma'am. They cut out any love story. They cut out fictitious characters. All of the people are at, like actual people that were there for the Titanic. They're the actual stories of what happened. This is the most meticulously researched story about the Titanic that there is. It was based off of a book called A Night to Remember, which the author researched and wrote for years to get the most authentic and accurate portrayal of Titanic that he could possibly get. And then they turned it into a movie. Of course, this is 1958. There's no computer generated imagery. How did they make it? How did they sink the ship? How did they do all of that? Well, they did it through miniatures. They did it through models. And it's really amazing if you watch behind the scenes, they have this, this huge boat that they made. It's hyper-realistic. It looks like the Titanic, and it's in this big body of water. So all of the, 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 the people that are making the film, they're like waist deep in this water. And then the, the rowboats of the people that are like getting away, there's, shot, there's like wide shots of the boat sinking and people rowing away in rowboats. The rowboats are like this big and they're models with a bunch of fake people in it and they're electric. So like, it's like a toy rowing away, but it's, it's pretty convincing. And there's a few shots where it's like, okay, that's a model. But considering it's 1958, the way they incorporated models and really huge sets as well is very impressive. I mean, this was at the time the biggest British film that's ever been made. Of course, the popularity of A Night to Remember has been eclipsed by the outrageous success of Titanic. But A Night to Remember, it's exciting. It's, you know, you really feel like you're watching a piece of history more so than when you watch Titanic, where you're watching a piece of spectacle entertainment. A Night to Remember feels much more like a legitimate document of, of what happened. And there are sequences in A Night to Remember that we're, that are literally like in Titanic, like the the way that they portray some of the events that are going on. James Cameron was obviously very influenced by A Night to Remember when he made when he made his film. But A Night to Remember is also a really fascinating watch right now because it, it really highlights how fucking long it took for the Titanic to sink. Because it didn't just, like, they hit the iceberg, and it doesn't, like, start sinking right away. They hit the iceberg, and then a bunch of ice falls onto the deck, and it actually, it has people clowning around, taking huge chunks of ice and running through the boat, like, I got a souvenir, you know, it's a, it's a piece of iceberg. And the, the crew of the ship have to actively convince people that something's going on. So this thing is just like, it's a crazy metaphor for COVID. There are people walking around who refuse to put on their life vests and they're like, this is uncomfortable. You want me to walk around with this? Or, oh, if everything is fine, why do I have to wear a life vest? Where's the logic there? And it's like, you can see anti-maskers taking arguments that they were using for why they shouldn't put a life vest on on the Titanic, or people being like, well, if it's going to sink and we're all going to die, what's a life vest going to do anyway, you know? And and it's just like, watching it now is like, oh my god, people have always been so petulant and stupid when it comes to their own safety. And then it shows the panic of people trying to get on the lifeboats and, you know, jumping on ahead of other people, and it shows the selfishness that people really feel. And of course, just like in COVID, the people that suffer the worst consequences are poor people and immigrants in, in Titanic. Those are the ones 
that uh, mostly were, were getting killed and couldn't fit onto the lifeboats. And of course, uh, communities of color and poor people are the ones most adversely hit by, by coronavirus. I think this is just like a remarkably apt metaphor for what's going on right now. Um, even if you're on a sinking ship, some people are going to refuse that it's a sinking ship until they're, until they're waist deep in water. But uh, movie number one, A Night to Remember, it's actually a really great British film. Hopefully you watch these movies and I aim to prove that disaster porn isn't just trash, but they some of these films are actually important documents and a couple others that we're gonna watch are as well. Okay, movie number two. This is the most popcorn trash movie of the bunch, but this was probably the most influential movie of the 90s as far as disaster porn goes. Armageddon by Michael Bay. This movie is, it is it is stupid, it's ridiculous. It's about a, a meteor that's gonna hit Earth, it's the size of Texas, it's gonna destroy all living life on the planet. So they have to get a group of ragtag oil drillers to get trained to go up into space so that they can land on the meteor and drill into it and, and break it up so that the two parts fly past Earth, that's their plan for, for saving the planet. And it just like the most ridiculous concept for a movie. It is undeniably fun, it's a star-studded cast. It is cheesy, but this thing is just like quintessential 90s, straight down to the end credits song. I mean, what is there to say about Armageddon? This was, <laughs> in, a bizarre, in a bizarre twist, the Criterion Collection accepted Armageddon. So Armageddon, Michael Bay has two movies in the Criterion Collection, Armageddon and The Rock, and I actually think they're both legitimately fun. But I had to put one kind of trashy popcorn movie on the quadruple feature, and I put the one that I think was kind of most influential for what came out in the 90s after that. This actually came out the same year as Deep Impact, which I thought was a legitimately really solid disaster porn film as well. But this one, this one just takes the cake for the uh, sheer excess of the movie. This movie is in part responsible for kind of where the industry has gone with like movies getting bigger and bigger and dumber and dumber and sacrificing believable plot, sacrificing character, sacrificing uh, anything that a good story might have for sheer entertainment value. But you gotta love it. It's just, it's just so stupid, it's just so fun. So that's movie number two, Armageddon. Okay, I said I wanted to pick films from, from different decades. Um, so we've got the, uh, the 50s, the 90s, and then we've got the aughts. Just a few years ago, actually, uh, came The Impossible, starring Naomi Watts and Ewan McGregor. This is about a family that's on vacation in Thailand, and they're just uh, on the beach at this really beautiful hotel, and a fucking tidal wave just decimates the hotel, separates the family, fucks them up, they're all damaged. And that happens really early on in the movie. This is the first thing that happened. So the entire movie is just a struggle for survival and reconnection for this family. It's probably the most heartfelt and emotional disaster porn movie that's ever been made. It really wears its heart on its sleeve and it makes you go through what these characters are going through. Uh, really great performances from all of them. And Tom Holland, who's like now Spider-Man, he's, he's one of the kids in the movie. And it's really just a fantastic harrowing experience. This was made by J.A. Bayona, who, um, you know, got his start with The Orphanage, and, you know, then he would go on to do, like, um, A Monster Calls and one of the Jurassic Park movies, Jurassic, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, he would he would do. So he's got a really great visual eye, and I, I love disaster porn movies that have a, a tidal wave in them, because one of my biggest fears is tidal waves and I don't know why I think when I was a really little kid I just saw a movie or a tv show that had a giant wave coming into a city and like and, and washing the, and washing everyone away and it really horrified me and it's really terrified me ever since so I had to get a tidal wave movie in here somewhere I mean I wanted to go with something a little more believable and realistic and the impossible is based off of a, a true story and it is really it's really just incredible and proof is in the pudding. Disaster porn doesn't have to just be summer movie trash. There can actually be like heart and genuine really good filmmaking there as well. Highly recommend The Impossible. Okay, movie number four. This this one came out in the 80s. This is another British film. And this one I feel is like the disaster porn to end all disaster porn films. So there's all kinds of things to be wary of in disaster porn movies, right? There's like meteors, there's earthquakes, there's fires, there are tidal waves, but the most realistic destruction of our planet or like an entire country is most likely going to be nuclear war. 
right? The movie that we're gonna wrap our quadruple feature up with is Threads. This one is pure disaster porn, and it's and it's it's entirely speculative of what would happen in a kind of a modern thriving city if nuclear war happened, if a nuclear bomb went off, what would be like the long-term effects? And this movie really delivers on that promise. It starts by letting you get to know the main characters, kind of learn their lives. And you see much like how we kind of absorb news in our everyday lives before 2016 is it's always kind of in the background. It's on a TV in the background. You, you catch glimpses of it. Maybe you're not reading the paper every day. Maybe you're not watching the news every day. If something big is going on, you're going to tune in. But usually it's like it's in the background. And that's how they treat it here. They kind of talk about it at the breakfast table. Like, oh my gosh, this leader, he's really, he's really, he's really crazy, right? You see headlines as someone walks past uh, paper in the bodega. You you see the the news on in the background, kind of giving you the backdrop for this for this fictional story in England. And then uh, a nuclear attack happens, and it is, I mean, I can't stress this enough. It's one of the most harrowing films that you will ever see because it wanted to give a, a very realistic long-term look at the effects of a nuclear bomb in a city. It doesn't just focus on the destruction. It focuses on the destruction. It focuses on the weeks after what nuclear radiation does to your body. It's really disturbing. Uh, you know, people go blind, people get sick, people are puking, people lose their hair. And then it goes on for years. Here's this one action and the long-term effects it's gonna have. It goes so far into the future to showing the disintegration of our language. People kind of forget to communicate after years of not talking, after years of no school, after years of not seeing other people. They're communicating like almost like animals. People kind of go feral. And it's, it's a fucking scary movie. I mean, this is disaster porn through and through, but not in the typical, let's just watch a city get destroyed entertaining way. This is disaster porn in a, oh my God, I really, really hope that never happens type of way. So highly recommend watching Threads. I think it came out in 1984. It was released on BBC. I don't even think it was released in theaters. It was released on British television. But yeah, this, this really shows the long-term effects that uh, that a nuclear blast could have. And it's it's terrifying, you know? This one is really a, a stark warning of, of, of what could happen. We're gonna be watching today for disaster porn 1958 a night to remember about the sinking of the titanic armageddon from the 90s by michael bay the cheesiest most over the top disaster porn movie that we're watching the heartfelt true story of the impossible and the british nightmare film threads those are the four films that we're going to be watching for disaster porn. Let's hope that no horrible disasters happen in the next couple months and hope that all of the devastating effects of climate change that are going on, hopefully it's not too late for us to start to reverse some of these things that we've been doing to the world because this doesn't look good for future generations. And we have we have hundreds of we have hundreds of movies warning of these types of disasters that could happen. So let's Let's listen to let's listen to cinema. Let's listen to shit like this that says uh, this is entirely possible and it will be absolutely horrible if climate change continues to get worse. So let's fix that. I hope you're celebrating today if you're watching this um, and you voted for Trump. That's on you, buddy. You were you were had by a snake oil salesman that you elected president. But fuck that guy. He better not come back in 2024. Congrats, Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. Let's hope this is the beginning of a lot of really great change in this country. Thanks for watching. See you next week.